Greetings, Race Community. Brent coming in live with today's guest, David Nolan, who serves as Associate Vice Chancellor of University Development and Campaign Director at Texas Christian University. Welcome, David. Thank you, Brent. Um, it's an honor and pleasure to be here. I appreciate you inviting me to join you. Well, just so everybody knows, we are recording this roughly three weeks before the TCU Horn Frogs play in the college football playoff. We did not know that when we booked this time with David. So we've got a whole extra theme to talk about the intersection of athletics and success and what that can mean for development. So we'll get there. All right, David. That sounds great. It's an exciting time. But in the meantime, I want to know more about your educational journey, your professional journey. Uh, and specifically, I would love to go back to junior, senior year of high school. Who was that guy? Where was he? And what led him to TCU? <laughs> um, that's that's a long way back, Brent. I'll uh, do my best to try to remember it accurately rather than... Uh, uh, you can embellish. Memory. Nobody will know. You know, you can, <laughs> you can change a few things. Nobody will uh, ever audit this one. So, yeah. What so, do you got? Yeah, when I was... Um, junior and senior in high school, my father was the vice president for university advancement at Bethany College in Bethany, West Virginia. So I uh, spent my high school years essentially living and playing on a college campus where my father was working in advancement. And so I uh, grew up around the business and later uh, my mom got in the business as well. So um you know, I, I grew up around, like I said, around college campus, around college kids, uh, around my dad, um, you know, going to events and, and meeting people and introducing me to people. And I just really was um, taken with uh, what a uh, fun environment uh, college campus could be and sort of how um, external work plays into to what happens on, on campus on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm, I guess I'm in the profession now, I'm a little bit of a unicorn in that I, I kind of grew up around it and was sort of oriented toward it before, before I even went to college. And, and um, so I, I came to TCU as an undergrad. I, I really was, um, to be completely candid, I came to TCU thinking I'm gonna major in finance, I'm gonna work in business, I'm gonna make a lot of money. And, uh, got into the business school and started studying finance. I'm like, you know, this, this is all the stuff I enjoy, but um, maybe it's not giving me everything that I was looking for and wanting in terms of deepening my education and understanding um, of, of the world. And I, I really felt myself being pulled into the liberal arts disciplines. And so I, I ended up getting a double major in college in English and religion. And looking back on it now and thinking about that history of where I came from in high school and Kind of where I was going in college, I, I really think my passion for English literature and for for comparative religion studies was oriented around understanding human condition and and people's attempt to understand that condition and people's attempt to uh, develop values and understand those values and the in, impact and influence of those values in our lives. And so that that just was a natural progression through those liberal arts studies and of arts disciplines into. Uh, you know, working in higher ed and, and working in advancement. I consider myself fairly well versed in higher education at this point, but I was not too familiar with Bethany College until you mentioned it. And I'm now learning it is one of both the oldest and smallest institutions in the country dating back to 1840. But it looks like a, a sub or around 10,000 person alumni community. So that's a pretty unique profile. Yeah, it's a pretty small place. The town of Bethany is is very small. It's uh, fairly remote, um, although it's only about an hour from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. That's in the summertime when when there's not snow on the road. Um, it, it could take a little longer in the winter, but um, so it's not it's not that isolated. But in terms of a town itself, it's pretty small. The college is small, but the way um, my story intersects with Bethany and with TCU is. Um, Bethany and TCU are both related to one another through the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. So the, the Christian Church Disciples of Christ denomination uh, is was at the heart of the founding of both Bethany College and then eventually down the road, uh, TCU. So um, there, there is a, a connection through the, the church history and heritage there uh, between the two institutions. So I came to TCU as an undergrad um, while my dad was working at, at Bethany. 
and um, and to make the story even um, more interesting or just sad, depending on how you look at it. My my father actually worked for TCU before he went to Bethany, so I did live in Fort Worth for a time when I was even younger and was exposed to TCU then. Then we moved to West Virginia, went to high school there. He was at Bethany, and then I came back and, and went to TCU for my undergrad years. Got it. And and so then it was a natural fit when you were thinking about making a few bucks, uh, getting a little experience while you're on campus to to swing over to the phonathon. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. It it wasn't honestly. I didn't you walk in and you say, said, "Look, I've got I, I'm 18. I've got 14 years of experience, and I <laughs> like this job." Yeah, it wasn't quite like that. Um, if anything, I was a little bit at the time leaning toward that's what. My dad did. I'm not 100% sure I want to do it too. And, you know, that kind of thing until I needed some money. I needed a job. So where are the jobs available? What did I know how to do? Where did I know people? So it came about more that way. But the, the more I got involved and the more I did it, the more I realized, hey, I, I really like this and seem to be, um, you know, good enough at it. And um, I just kept kept working at it and kept sort of learning and, and um practicing. And yeah, so I, I was part of the phonathon. I was part of a group here called Student Foundation, which at the time was the students that help host events and do tours and all that kind of stuff. So I was plugged in that way. And I just found myself getting pulled more and more into uh, sort of those roles and, and opportunities to interact with people and to uh, sort of promote the campus. And, and um, that just, uh, I guess, hasn't stopped. Well, you must have enjoyed the work uh, enough in that it, it led, it looks like, to a sort of immediate opportunity coming out of college to stay in the field. But I have to just ask, when you think about that uh, student caller world that you grew up in, and it is um, so many leaders started right in that in that role. Most did not have a father who worked in advancement. And so that was the, the gateway drug to development for many folks, I guess. Yeah. And I just have to ask, when you think about you know, that experience, the people that you worked with at the time, uh, were there characteristics that stood out to you among your peers or maybe even yourself that helped ensure people would succeed um, or else very clearly not succeed in a role like that, which is pretty demanding? Yeah, I think um, what was interesting to me about it, so all through high school, I um, I. I started a business to make money. So I was, I was mowing lawns and helping take care of people's house. I would house sit and pet sit and mow lawns and do landscape work and all that kind of stuff. So I started my own business and I did that all through high school, you know, so I was working for myself basically. And I was just, you know, it was just hiring out my labor. And when I got to the phonathon, um, it was a, a paid student caller position. And I guess sort of initially, even with my background and experience, sort of knowing a little bit more about it than, than a lot of other students did certainly at the time, um, I'd never you know, done it before. I'd never been employed that way before or worked uh, professionally for somebody else that way. And I, you know, first and foremost, it was just really the reinforcement of you know, when somebody else is paying you, they have expectations for what you're going to do during the time that they're paying you for. And um, they're going to tell you what it is that, that they want need you to do. And they're going to help put you in the best position uh, to be successful as possible because that, that benefits them. But at the end of the day, you got to get the, you got to get the job done and you got to show up on time. You know, you got to put in the effort, you got to learn what you need to know, practice, you know, ask for help when you need it and those kinds of things. So I think just um, all of those skills that are great life skills and certainly great um, skills for you know, to be an employee of any kind of organization, uh, it was my first real jump into to that kind of environment. And um, I think it really, whether I ended up doing advancement the rest of my life or not, I wouldn't change that experience for anything because um, it really was a great uh, insight into what it's like to, to work for an organization before I graduated. Um, and so I didn't have to learn that kind of on the job after the fact. And so then at what point did the full-time opportunity immediate post-college emerge? Was that something that you expressed interest in? Were you kind of uh, preemptively uh, recruited by the team there before you could go and network for other jobs? I mean, what was that experience like? So um, 
the facts of the matter are when you switch from a finance major to an English and religion double major, um, you do get a little nervous about what the job market's going to be like and um, are you going to be able to support yourself. And um, obviously, as a phone-to-phone caller and student foundation member and all of that, I got to know a lot of people in the advancement division. And um, I, I ended up just um, scheduling an appointment with the vice chancellor for advancement at the time and just went in and said, look, here's my background experience. Here's where I came from. Here's what I've been doing. Um, I'm trying to discern whether or not this is something I want to do professionally post-graduation or not. I sure would like to figure that out before I graduate, if at all possible. Um, is there anything I can do uh, beyond what I'm doing now to gain additional experience, to further uh, check this out, see if it's anything that um, I want and can do longer term. And, and to, my, to TCU's credit and to my benefit, um, the vice chancellor and the team were great. They said, hey, let's set up sort of an internship type program uh, we'll run you through all the different departments, all the different programs. You'll get to meet the people you don't already know, get to get deeper insight into what they do, help out with some stuff along the way. And, you know, we'll just see what happens. I said, that sounds great. So, you know, we started that um, and I kind of did that my whole senior year um, at TCU. And then in the spring semester before graduation, they had a, um, a position come open on the annual fund staff. And so it was both I saw that and I'm like, okay, maybe this is a good next step. And then they came to me and said, hey, this is coming up. You know, do you think this might be a good next step? And so that just started that conversation about the opportunity and, and how did that look for both of us? And, and do we think that could pan out? And, and again, to my benefit, it, um, it ended up working out. I, I graduated in, in May and then um, started June 1 uh, on the annual fund staff. And um, uh, yeah, it was a great, great first step in my my development career for sure. Love that. Love that. And it sounds like, uh, you know, one of the lessons there is, um, you know, don't be, don't be shy. If, if, you know, it helps to be a little assertive, doesn't mean you got to be pushy, but you know, maybe if you hadn't scheduled that meeting and had that sit down, we might not be talking right now. And that's sort of how, how careers can, can quickly, um, pivot. I, totally agree with that, Brent. And I, I think it's still true to this day. And I have similar conversations with, with students now that by and large, most people out there want to be helpful. Most people are inclined toward helping students and helping young career professionals. Um, but it's not a situation where they're necessarily always out there looking for who they can pick and, you know, and help. And so a lot of times it's just showing up and putting yourself in the the right position um, to be noticed and, and to be picked up and, and supported in that way. So um, it's definitely a two-way street. There has to be a receptiveness there on the part of, of folks to, to really you know, want to help folks. But, but you, to, to a large degree, you do have to, to uh, raise your hand and, and put yourself in the right position. Well, look, I think it applies to fundraising too, right? I mean, most Absolutely. people, um, most people, loved their college experience. You know, most people talk about it fondly, not everybody, but most people had a good experience. Um, doesn't mean that they're uh, thinking every day, hey, what can I do philanthropically to support the institution? What can I do to give back? But there's a positive inclination. And, you know, what does it require when seeking mentorship? Oftentimes it requires some polite persistence, right? Consistency of outreach. I mean, I have students reach out to me all the time. I get a lot of emails. Sometimes I don't respond to the first one and then they never write back. Some other, you know, students will write three times and then you see that. And of course, I want to help. I want to do calls with all of them. I wish I could all day, every day. That would be a lot of fun. I can't. Um, and so sometimes it is just the difference between the second attempt or the third attempt. Uh, and it's amazing how many people just stop after one attempt and then they go home thinking, I emailed Brent. He is a bad guy, not interested, doesn't want to help me. I annoyed him. They jumped to worst case conclusion. <laughs> That's true. And the reality is like, absolutely want to help. Feel bad that I didn't get back to you right away. Wish you would have written back a second time because I would have gladly taken the meeting. And I feel like that is one of the real issues in development too, which is I reached out, they didn't write back. They must hate me and TCU, right? And yes. it's like, no, odds are, they love TCU. They're not really thinking that much about you. They're busy on other things. And so how do you balance that sort of 
persistence with obviously not wanting to annoy someone. Yeah, I um, we we talk a lot with our team about um, timing and circumstance, and we don't always know if if we're not already in relationship with uh, an alum or a parent or a friend or you know any any prospective um, uh, donor or volunteer or anyone. If if we're not already in relationship with them, we we probably don't know what's going on in their life and whether or not it's a good time and <laughs> you know what else they have going on and. And I think we do make, like you said, I totally agree. We, we tend to make a lot of assumptions and those assumptions generally trend toward the negative um, rather than just saying, okay, maybe it wasn't the right time. Maybe it wasn't the right uh, approach. Maybe it wasn't, you know, whatever it could, you know, and how do I keep trying to figure out what the right formula is? And so that definitely that persistence, that, that tenacity, that um, don't, don't give up on the first try, don't assume the worst. Um, you know, until somebody says, Hey, quit bugging me. Um, it's probably just timing and circumstance. And so when you get the timing and the circumstance, right. Um, you'll probably have an opportunity to have a conversation. Yeah. We talk a lot about the, you know, this idea of, um, portfolio purgatory. Like there is a set of people where, where we literally don't know where they are, right. We don't know if it's positive or negative. We're going to assume sometimes, you know, We'll assume more negative, um, but the reality is I'd rather get a clear no than indifference or a lack of clarity. And so getting to a clear no is success because now you know where that individual stands. And, and there are just so many folks who get one email, a second email, they never get a third. And we really don't know. They might absolutely love TCU and be decked out in purple every single weekend, or maybe they're totally indifferent, but we have no way of yeah. knowing. So, you know, getting okay. to a clear no. Um, is a win. I, I totally agree. And I, I, I looked at it that way when I was on the, the annual fund team and, you know, really that work is, is numbers work. Right. And uh, I sort of saw a no as a win because it, that's one step closer to a yes. So there, there is a formula, right? So you're going to have to contact X number of people to have Y number of conversations and you're going to get Z number of no's. And, you know, that that's going to get you closer to the next yes. And so I, I totally agree that, you know, get a clear answer, you know, create the circumstance which you can have the conversation you want to have and, and get the answer. And then it's either um, no, okay, you know, obviously timing and circumstance weren't right. We'll set that aside for now. You know, we'll revisit that another time, but that means I'm one step closer to a yes. Who's that going to be? Let's, you know, move on to that next, yeah. uh, next conversation. Yep. Tell me about the decision to uh, go to the Peace Corps. <laughs> um, well, I, so when I was an undergraduate, I, I had never been out of the United States. Uh, and I was, I, I really don't even remember so long ago what my initial interest was, but I was just like, hey, seems like there's a big world out there and I, I haven't seen much of it. And I sure would like to go see what it's all about. And so as an undergrad, I, um, was fortunate to be able to do two different study abroad um, experiences. So I spent a summer in uh, Greece and Italy with a favorite professor of mine uh, looking at religious art history and, and sort of, um, uh, you know, the Western religious tradition coming out of Greece and Italy. And so that, that was an amazing experience. And that was over a summer. And I was like, hey, I want more of that. And so I ended up um, then spending a semester uh, at uh, Oxford in, in England. So uh, that was a chance to, to live abroad for a longer period of time and to study sort of in a different place. And, um, that was just so eye-opening to me in terms of um, the vastness of the, the rest of the world and the difference of perspectives and, and you know, the way people dressed and ate and talked and, you know, all of that stuff, thought and um, I also, frankly, was a little bit embarrassed because most of the students I interacted with at Oxford knew more about American history and politics than I did. And so that sort of kicked me into high gear about, look, I, I need to be a more knowledgeable citizen of my own country before I can be uh, a productive citizen internationally. And so um, that, that was all great uh, as an undergrad. And I, I think I always had that desire to keep keep going, like keep, keep exploring, keep um, learning, keep encountering new people, new culture. And uh, so I always had that in the back of my mind. But when I 
graduated, I, I needed, I needed a job. I needed to make some money. I needed to be able to support myself. Um, so I took that step initially. And, and while I was working at TCU, I met, married my wife and she was finishing graduate school. And so, you know, that was another reason why money at the time was important and all that. So, but we got to a point where she had finished grad school. She would completed her student teaching. I had been on the annual fund staff for almost five years, which in those days, that was an eternity and, and that kind of work. And I'd been at TCU, you know, for uh, nine years by that point. So I did my undergrad and then went right in, uh, into the annual fund staff. So I was ready to sort of take a leap and do something new and different. She was at a similar place in her life. She had also studied abroad. So this conversation started between the two of us of, well, what if, what if we did something internationally before we uh, decided to have kids and, you know, settle down in, in the way that, that that requires? And so we looked at a lot of different options and opportunities and um, for a variety of reasons ended up uh, landing on, on the Peace Corps. And so we served for two years in the former Soviet Republic of Moldova, which until this year, nobody had ever heard of. And, and of course, now they're, they're in the news with the, the war in Ukraine. But um, it, was, it was an amazing two-year experience. And um, it was both personally and professionally rewarding because I had an opportunity through the Peace Corps to work in uh, non-governmental organization development. So if you think outside of the US, most of what we call nonprofits are, are called non-governmental organizations because outside of the US, it's either business or government and that's pretty much it. So this non-governmental sector is the, uh, what we call nonprofits. And so I, I got a chance to work in that sector in the former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe at a, a pretty interesting time, just a couple of years after um, the Iron Curtain fell and the wall came down and, and all of that. So it was a fascinating place, fascinating time, fascinating work. And um, I'm just really glad that uh, my wife and I had that opportunity to do that together. And that sort of became a foundational experience in our marriage, our relationship and, and our personal and professional growth and, and evolution. That's amazing. I mean, what a, what a neat um what a neat experience and to be able to do that um as a as a young married couple i mean that's that's so cool um as everybody listening knows moldova is wedged in between ukraine and romania uh landlocked ish i think um based on what i can tell here my brother actually has a very good friend who grew up in moldova of all oh, places really? um but but for those who haven't spent uh time in that region, including me, what's one or two things everybody should know about Moldova, but probably don't? Um, so Moldova sort of, during the Soviet times, Moldova was one of the bread baskets of the Soviet Union. So it's a very small uh, country geographically, but the land is very rich and fertile and, and the people take great pride in the agribusiness agri there and um, uh, they grow a lot of uh, different crops and, and things. And so. Uh, it's a beautiful country, rolling hills and the, you know, the fields and, and really interesting from, from that standpoint, geographically and, and agribusiness. And, things. and I, this sounds trite and I certainly don't mean it to be because um, I think people say this a lot, but it, the, the people, I mean, it, it, the way we were received in small villages around the country of Moldova um, and the way the hospitality that people practice in a rural agricultural society like that. Um, I, I grew up in cities and, you know, I visited different small towns or, you know, I've seen farms surely, but I just, I hadn't spent intensive time with, with people um, in that kind of uh, environment. And the, like I said, the, the hospitality was just unbelievable. We, we came to finally call it a contact sport. Um, uh, of how you you know had to engage in in this this ritual of, of hospitality, but boy, what what um, an experience it was to think about how we engage people in our work and how we make people feel uh, through that engagement process and the hospitality we practice when we invite people back to campus or to be part of something. Um, it, it was pretty foundational um, thinking back to to how we were welcomed and received and and how that made us feel, and then how in turn we wanted to help other people feel that way too. And from a language perspective, there's a mix of Moldovan, Russian, and Ukrainian spoken. Did you pick up 
any of those or were you required to as part of the program or? Yeah, so so linguistically, this was this was one of the biggest challenges. Um, so in order for a country to host Peace Corps volunteers, the country has to have um, the U.S. government and the, and the host country government have to have an, an agreement that Peace Corps volunteers will be allowed in. And part of that agreement is establishing, okay, what's the state language? What's the state, you know, this, that, and the other. And, you know, we have to adhere to those agreements. Well, after Moldova broke away from the Soviet Union, um, it wanted to align more with its history and heritage in Romania, which was more aligning with the West. So the official language in the country when we served there was um, Moldovan, which linguistically is Romanian. The challenge is at the time, less than half of the population knew Moldovan because for the whole period of the Soviet occupation, everybody was required to read, write, and conduct business in Russian. And so 100% of the population knew Russian, only half the population knew Moldovan. That half of the population tended to be the rural farmers who were outside of the power structures that were in the cities and in, in the government and the business. So um, we were required to learn Romanian because that was the state language. And we did really great out in the villages, but uh, it was a little bit more challenging in, in the cities and in the official uh, structure because uh, not everybody knew that language. Um, and then, yes, some, some people in the northern part of Moldova, their families have lived in the same village for generations, and they've either been um, living in Romania, Moldova, Ukraine, Soviet Union, like the, the country affiliation of that village has changed you know, six or eight times during their family's generational history, but they've lived in the same same place. And then in, in it, to make it even further complicated, the, the south part of the country was occupied by the Ottoman Turks at a time. And so there's a there's a territory is kind of referred to as Gagauzia, and they have their own language that's a mix of language and all of this. So it was a really culturally and linguistically rich dynamic environment, which is uh, really interesting and um, and fun on one hand, but incredibly frustrating on another when you think you're starting to figure out this language and how to get along and then realize, you know, that doesn't even give you the ability to communicate. And there was no Duolingo. So, uh, <laughs> no, I yeah, we, did, we didn't have uh, smartphones in those days. Uh, we, we barely had email. Um, and uh, so, yeah, we were kind of having to figure it out as we went. Wow. I love it. Um, I won't put you on the spot and ask you to, you know, give a pep talk in Moldovan or anything like that right now. But uh, <laughs> well, well, I will. The last thing I'll say about that is, um, uh, my wife and I did learn Romanian fairly well, and um, raising our kids, it was kind of fun to have a, a language that my wife and I knew that the kids didn't know, um, and uh, that was very helpful is, on on numerous occasions. That is a uh, that is a veteran crafty move right there. Uh, when you're speaking Moldovan around the house in Fort Worth, that's not probably uh, all that common. I love it. Um, <laughs> and, and so ultimately, you had the two year adventure, uh, and then it was a little bit back to uh, back to reality, or you know, back to the to the mainland. I mean, was it sort of a a natural like we did this? Now let's get back to our lives, or or did you consider I don't know more extreme adventures from there? I, I'm not sure I understood this about myself at the time, but reflecting back on these pivotal moments in my life and my career, I, I kind of have come to realize that um, I, I go into something generally with a plan. So, you know, my plan is to do ABC, but I always try to be open to what other options and opportunities and possibilities emerge while I'm on that path, you know, that I set out with the plan. And quite candidly, the, the plan was to do Peace Corps and then come back to the US and, you know, get a, get a job, start having kids, build family, career, all that kind of stuff. That, that's what the plan was. Um, when, when our service was coming to a conclusion and we were having to make, you know, decisions about what's next, we, we actually considered several opportunities that would have kept us living and working abroad um, longer. Uh, there are just a lot of opportunities for, um, uh, you know, expat type, type jobs and, and roles, both 
for-profit, non-profit, and, and we looked at some of those and considered those. We had the language skills. We were used to living on, um, uh, you know, li living in a different environment, adapting to language and culture and all of that, and, and living sort of at a, a, a modest lifestyle. So like, let's just keep going. And um, ultimately though, part of what the Peace Corps did for me was it, it reinforced that higher education was, was really important to me. It was important to me personally in my journey, but it was also important to me in terms of the impact that that has on the world. And I think I really saw that in Moldova looking at um, who went to, to college and how that worked for them in Moldova and elsewhere in Eastern Europe, and then thinking about how that works in the US. And um, so I, I really, sort of said, you know, I could go on and do something internationally, but what, what I'm really passionate about, what I really think, where I really think I want to try to make a difference is, is within higher education in the U.S. And um, so that sort of set the course then for, okay, where, where do we go? What do we do? And so I just started reaching out from Moldova to friends and former colleagues and, and folks that I knew back in the U.S. that were, that were still working in higher development. And um, ultimately, a, a very good friend of mine convinced me to come uh, look at, at Virginia Tech in Blacksburg, Virginia. And um, they had some openings and, and uh, he was, uh, he loved it there. He, he was a uh, Virginia Tech alum and he worked in development there. And he's like, you got to come check this place out. I think you'll really like it. And um, so we did and ultimately uh, had an opportunity to, to join the staff there. And it was looking back on it, Brent, it was a great transition for us coming out of Moldova coming back into the US. Blacksburg is a very small town, uh, rural community. Uh, Virginia Tech's a great school. It's uh, rooted in the land grant mission, very agriculturally oriented, you know, engineering technology, all that stuff. And it was, it's a lot of, um, a lot of first generation kind of blue collar folks that uh, go to school there or did at the time. And so it was, it was a really great experience of transition for us coming back from Moldova, working our way back into the US. And, landing there and I, I owe that opportunity to uh, you know to folks kind of opening doors for me opening my eyes to, to possibilities and um, it was a great uh, a great experience I really enjoyed people I worked with there and the work I got to do there and, um, and the exposure it gave me to to the land grant mission and history that I just hadn't uh, seen before who was leading uh, the advancement organization at Virginia Tech at the time so when I when I got there, uh, Terry Wood was the vice chancellor for advancement and, and the AVP um, uh, was uh, Nevin Kessler. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I misspoke. Terry Wood was at NC State when I went there. Um, Steger, Charles Steger was the, uh, the vice president at, um, at Virginia Tech and um, Nevin Kessler was my AVP. And, um, so worked with him. And then Phil Buchanan is the, the friend that, that uh, helped get me there. And so can I just ask after that sort of global experience, did it feel different or was it sort of like riding a bike back to uh, back to basics of, of development work? Um, well, I, I think with, I, I think obviously there was transition, right? There was transition when we left the U S and went to, to Europe and there was transition when we left Europe and came back to the U S. So that, that's more, um, you know, just getting culturally reoriented and those kinds of things in terms of the work. Um, you know, clearly I, I had a familiarity and an appreciation for a college campus. And so that, that felt, uh, normal and natural for me. Um, but the, you know, the people I was working with, the work I was doing, uh, it was a it was more of a major gift role within a school and college versus you know a university wide uh, annual fund type environment. So um, that was very different, but that's what I I wanted um, in terms of developing my career. And so um, certainly learning curve there. And um, but I to to a large degree I had learned sort of the basic skills and and things when I was uh, on the annual fund staff at, at, at TCU, and I think that helped me. Uh, navigate that transition back into to the role at Virginia Tech. Both with Virginia Tech and then at NC State, you were uh, embedded and, and connected with the College of Engineering in both instances. And 
Uh, just yesterday, I recorded an episode with Kyle Edgington up the road in Dallas at, at UT Dallas, and he was talking about the importance of the um, partnership when you're in a in a school or unit with the leader and just how that sort of dean involvement or the dean's engagement and fundraising um, can really be make or break in, in a lot of um, in a lot of ways. And so I'm just curious what observations or experiences you might have had in a more focused um, area like engineering. Yeah. It, uh, so it was interesting at Virginia Tech, the dean of the College of Engineering at the time, uh, Dean Stevenson, was um, a native of the UK. And so he, you know, found his way to U.S. higher ed from, from the UK and uh, spoke with this lovely accent. He was just a perfect gentleman and obviously super smart and just really engaging. And I, I learned a lot from him just about how to be in the world and how to present yourself and how to engage people. And, um, and he had a, a delightful way of having expectations and motivating you and holding you accountable, but also making you feel wonderful uh, in the process. And so I just terms of a personal relationship and interaction there. Um, uh, that, that was really great. He was wonderful to learn from. Um, it was interesting making the transition. You know, I, like I said earlier, I, I went to uh, a primarily liberal arts college and I studied in the liberal arts and, um, and to work in an engineering environment was um, a little bit of a stretch for me, um, just in terms of uh, the way engineers think, uh, the way they study, the way, you know, um, just the, the way they view the world and, and all of that. It was a, a bit of a learning curve, but I really came to, to appreciate it after uh, I got familiar with it. And um, I, I don't, I remember the Dean at NC State and um, when I moved from Virginia Tech to NC State, I was a little bit more in a, in a leadership role in engineering development at, at NC State. And I had my first meeting with the Dean and, and he said, where's the spreadsheet? And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, you know, I don't have any meetings that don't involve a spreadsheet. And I had gone in to talk about prospects and I wanted to talk about relationships and uh, you know what was important to people and all that. And, and he wanted to see the data. And so it was a uh, really great learning experience for me and frankly for him that um, I had something to bring to the table that he needed to better understand. And he clearly had a lot that, that I needed to better understand. And so together we sort of figured out, okay, here's, here's what, I saw and knew and, the, and what I could bring uh, to this work. And, and then I was you know, open to and willing and able and wanted to learn from him about how best to, to, to understand engineers and, and what they're looking for and wanting and needing and how we can present things in the best way uh, to capture their attention and imagination. And so um, a really, uh, really great uh, learning experience in, in that way. Um, and, and then yes, more to your point, um, it's really where I got to do, you know, initially do the work of matching up people and their interest and their philanthropy with a specific need or opportunity or, or person or program that, that could benefit from, from their philanthropic investment and doing that at a, a much more intentional level than an annual fund, you know, which is more, as many people give as much as they can, you know, as often as they can. It, it, this was uh, more of that matchmaking process. And that that honestly is what um, I think that's when and where I committed the rest of my career to the best of my ability. As long as I have the ability to choose what I do and where I do it and how I do it, um, that that's what I wanted to do the rest of my life is um, facilitate those kinds of engagements, those kinds of relationships. And what I came to learn, I think, along the way through all of this is that um, oftentimes donors experience real joy and a real sense of accomplishment through the investments that they make philanthropically. And I think as a young development officer, as a new development professional, um, you're more focused on getting the money and putting it to work at your organization and maybe a little bit less focused on the meaningfulness of that um, experience for the donor. And, and I think the more you do it and the more you're around it all, the more you come to realize that, okay, there's there's dual benefit here. Pe people have a need and a desire to, to help. They have a, um, a real uh, positive experience in giving. And if you can match that in the best way where they're making a really good investment and getting a really high return. I, I love what 
uh, advancement resources says in terms of that return on philanthropic investment. I just, um, I've seen that time and again from all the donors I've worked with at all the organizations I've been at. Um, that's, that's really where, where uh, again, to, to quote advancement resources, that's where the development magic happens. And um, that's what I think really fuels my, my career. And I, I hope everyone else in, in this business, I hope they, they sense that. I love that. And look, we've said it before, but philanthropy is the ultimate discretionary purchase. Um, and somebody was just commenting the other day that it sort of breaks a lot of economic theory. Like it makes no economic sense that someone might just give their money away. Um, obviously it's, it's irrational. As, right. As it's irrational. Right? And, you know, and then you have to frame it around impact and, and so forth. But even then it's the ultimate discretionary gift. And I think that's where it is such a fascinating space because there are not too many sectors where, you know, the product that you're selling, or in your case, the mission that you're selling has price points that range from very, very small $5 I'll chip in to help the annual fund all the way up to 50 million or now even $500 million, I'll do something transformative. There's there's no other companies that sell that price point, right? I mean, Amazon doesn't do it. Walmart doesn't do it. Tesla doesn't do it. It doesn't really matter. You name it. It's very unique to philanthropy. The, the thing I would add to that, I agree. Uh, the thing I would add is that, you know, over the course of my life and career and just, uh, I did a, Masters in philanthropic studies as well, so I've I've studied this academically and continue to be try to be a, a good student of, of philanthropy, um, you know, now and, and hopefully for the rest of my career. But you know, the numbers the numbers keep getting bigger, and on on one hand, I, I worry a little bit about that in terms of the size of uh, gifts that people are making. On the other hand, if you really buy into the idea that philanthropy is the the monetary representation of people's hopes and dreams <laughs> and and the desire to have more of that positive experience that they experience when they engage in philanthropy, then I, I think the sky's the limit. Um, and as long as people continue to, to experience economic success and um, continue to value and appreciate higher education, I just, I, I think in a lot of ways, the sky's the limit. Now, the thing I do worry about is artificial constructs that we've created for ourselves that constrain sort of that natural uh, personal uh, engagement and experience. And so, you know, you get ever larger campaign goals and, you know, your you know, constraints from timeline perspective, all these things that we do to sort of pressurize the system or create that sense of urgency sometimes um, can be counter to that natural engagement and, and relationship cycle. So I, I just want to make sure we're always earning the right to ask. And, and not being driven, you know, in a negative way by those goals and, and constructs that we've created um, along the way. Did you stay in touch with folks at TCU as you, I mean, probably not that easy to stay in touch with anybody from Moldova, but when you were back in Blacksburg or you're up at NC State, um, did you maintain those relationships and ultimately what led to the opportunity to, to come home in 2005? Well, um, yes. Yeah, so I, I actually, when, when we came back from Peace Corps, I interviewed both at TCU to uh, TCU invited me to, to come back after the Peace Corps experience and then Virginia Tech and a couple of other places. And, um, at the time it was tempting to just come back to Fort Worth and, and jump right in where, where I left off. And, um, but, but ultimately we decided to go somewhere completely different and, and do something completely new and different because that was the path we had set off on when we did the Peace Corps in the first place. So, um, uh, so yes, the, you know, coming back to TCU was already on my mind uh, immediately after Peace Corps, but um, after being at Virginia Tech and that leading to NC State and being at NC State for a while, yes, I tried to stay in touch with TCU as my alma mater and as my former Warrior and um, uh, try to keep up with what was going on. I, you know, I, I tried to, to be a regular uh, donor to, to the university and stay engaged in, in what was happening. And um, I originally applied for for a different job at, at TCU. And in the course of uh, pursuing that opportunity, it, it led to to uh, to what I'm doing now. And um, and part of that was some existing relationships with people said, hey, we know this guy, he's, you know, he's okay. 
we need to talk to him. And then part of it was, you know, new folks saying, um, yeah, we'd love, you know, since we've got some new people, we'd love to have some of the, uh, you know, the, the TCU product and then the TCU history and, and knowledge as well. And, and so it was just a nice partnership um, opportunity that, that evolved out of those conversations. Well, tell me where you are now. You're in the middle of uh, uh, lead on a campaign for TCU, billion dollar campaign. Um, and you were doing that before this fall. But I do have to ask, when you think about, as I teed up at the beginning, you know, you're going to do the billion dollar campaign either way. And, and, and the needs and the impact, the purpose are, are consistent today as they were six months ago. But what is it like being in the middle of a campaign with this sort of lightning in a bottle football season that you all have had with maybe more uh, drama than some people wanted uh, right at the end here? But um, just just tell me a little bit about that. I don't want this to just be about football, but it is fascinating to just think about that um, emotional maybe lift that uh, it might generate. Or maybe it's a big distraction and it actually makes fundraising harder. I don't, I don't know. You tell me. Um, so I, I'm, I'm pleased to be able to say, you know, this, this isn't, I mean, it's TCU's first opportunity to be in the current college football playoff, uh, scenario. So that obviously is something new and unique and different and really special, but it's not TCU's first rodeo, you know, experiencing a high level of, of athletic success. Uh, we've been to the Fiesta Bowl before we've been to the Rose Bowl, um, TCU embraced, uh, a long time ago athletics as a meaningful part of the student and university life and experience and can be a great uh, gateway for people discovering what you have to offer. And so uh, athletics has always been, been important. What, what I can say with, with uh, no uncertainty is that when, when your institution is on the national stage and by and large, mostly being reflected positively in terms of success or recognition, or you know, you've got a quarterback finalist in the Heisman, you've got coaches winning awards, you you know, you're playing in the college football playoffs, all of that. It just it raises your profile, it captures attention and imagination, and what what I say a lot around the office is it it, it significantly increases people's desire to affiliate, right. So if you were a student at TCU and, and then you left Texas and your career is taking you around the world and you're living in Timbuktu doing who knows what and you haven't been back to campus in, in decades and you're really not that connected, um, boy, you know, if your team's playing in the championship, then that gets your attention. And, and then, you know, you're a little bit more uh, proud of your affiliation and you're a little bit more excited about your alma mater and it just... It, it creates that environment then where maybe you can have a conversation that, that might not have been possible before. So that increased desire to affiliate is really important. Um, I, I do think it makes people feel good. I mean, just to get down to professional nuts and bolts, it takes an excuse off the table, right? If, if, if your excuse is, well, I'm not going to support you because you're, you know, athletics is what I care about. And you're not successful in athletics, you know, it takes that excuse off the table. So so there's a lot of dynamics to it. And by and large, I say overall, it's, it's positive and um, helpful. But yes, if um, somebody can't get tickets or, um, you know, all that kind of stuff, it, it can, be, can be challenging too. Yeah, I mean, there's this idea in advertising of uh, earned media versus paid media, right? So am I, yeah. am I paying for uh, the billboard or am I paying for the Google ad or the Facebook ad um, or are or am I earning it by way of uh, placement and just relevance? And so this is kind of the ultimate earned media where uh, TCU is being talked about a lot, um, even though it might always be, uh, it's, it's an extra level of, of the spotlight. Um, and you know that a majority or you know, significant portion of the alumni community is talking about TCU right now. They might not be talking about philanthropy or the campaign, but the brand is elevated, the media is earned, um, and hopefully that creates uh, higher response rates. And I know that we even just had the TCU uh, Gives Day where there's been great collaboration among our teams where um, you know, it, it, it just can't hurt to have the positive sentiment sort of around the community. Absolutely, um, agree 100%, well said. 
So tell me about where you all are, uh, about the organization today, what you're excited about, um, growth, hiring. I mean, what, what, um, yeah, what's top of mind besides football? Um, we're at a pretty interesting time. We, um, you know, we're hoping to wrap this campaign up by the end of the current fiscal year, which for us is May 31. Um, as you pointed to earlier, we're, we're committed to the goal. If, you know, we're trying our best to do everything we can to, to complete the goal by, by May 31. But if, if we're not there um, at that time, you know, we'll keep going as long as it takes, but hopefully we can, can finish up by then. And I think the, the thing you worry about in, in leadership in this business is, okay, you wrap up the campaign, let's say, you know, it wraps up by May 31, new fiscal year starts on June 1. You can't show up to work on June 1 and say, okay, what do we do now? Um, so we're at this moment where we're having to both focus on trying to complete the campaign successfully, but also commit a certain amount of time and attention to what happens next. And um, that's both fun and exciting and also stressful and concerning all, all at the same time, just wanting to, to try to get it right. And um, along the way during the campaign, you know, we continue to try to analyze our organizational structure and our staffing alignment and who's doing what and how's it working and are we getting the response that we uh, thought we would get and, and if not, you know, what can we do differently and those kinds of things. And um, really appreciate you, Bren and Evertrue kind of going along on some of these journeys with us when we decided to um, just, you know, close down the, the phonathon that had existed for, you know, generations that I had been a, a part of a long, long time ago. And, and um, you know, in one sense, that was scary because that had been such a part of who we are and what we do for so long. And, and, and in another sense, it was freeing and kind of opened up some new opportunities and possibilities through um, you know, the XO program and, and all the other things that, that we're doing now. And so um, that's all been a lot of fun. I think it's given us courage and, um, and uh, a lot of uh, um, excitement and enthusiasm for what else could we do? What else could we do new and different and um, that uh, might help us even you know, increase the, the success of our work and increase our interest and, and engagement ourselves as, as uh, employees in what we're doing. And so um, we're, we're trying our best not to just fill positions if and when they open, we're trying our best to orchestrate who we need on the team and what they need to be doing and how that needs to be aligned and take every opportunity to, to revisit that and rethink that and reshape that. Um, not in a way that gives anybody, you know, total anxiety about not knowing what they're going to do tomorrow, but um, in a way that uh, helps people be free from being, you know, chained to something and feeling like they've got option and opportunity and, and it, you know, again, just being limited only by our imagination and, and the results that we think we can get. No, look, I mean, we, we like I said earlier, when you were sharing your phonathon experience, um, creating ways for students to authentically engage with donors is critical. You know, should it look the way that it did in 1990? No, it shouldn't. Not today. But can we evolve and sort of take the best of what your experience was or what my experience as a volunteer might have been and, and modernize it uh, in a manner that both elevates the personalization by way of new channels, but also scales the reach? And, and I, I heard from our colleague, Amy Fury, who works closely with your team, that on your Gives Day, um, over 18,000 unique thank views were shared by your student team uh, in a way that is really kind of like Phonathon 2.0 and, and the results are still being tallied here, but it looks like quite promising from what we can tell, not only in the context of donors and dollars, but also donors, dollars and pipeline, which I think historically has been one of the real missing links around student programs is it was personal and authentic, hopefully, um, but quite transactional. And sometimes, you know, if you ask somebody for a hundred dollars, they'll give a hundred, even though they might easily be able to add a couple of zeros uh, or more uh, to, to that donation. And that's, I think the balance that we're gonna need to strike is how do we continue to scale, personalize it, uh, but really be able to think donors dollars and pipeline earlier in the life cycle. Yeah, I agree. It's, um, we were really pleased with, with 
the results of um, that student engagement for for Gives Day. And I'll, I'll tell you, it was it's been a really long time since we had eighteen thousand people answer a phoneathon call. Um, but eighteen thousand people opened a video from a student on their cell phone, and um, the comments you know, we've been using Thank View to deliver um, our, these videos for for a long time, and um, we still, you know, I, I kind of worry, are you know, are we saturating? The market is it going to stop being fun and interesting and cool new thing and you know are people going to start wearing out on it or whatever? But we still, even after eighteen thousand you know personalized videos that we sent out uh, through Gives Day, uh, people still take time to respond both to the student and to us and say, you know, this is so amazing. Thank you so much. You know, and and they just feel that connection and that level of engagement that goes beyond. Uh, oh, this is the phoneathon call coming in that you know well, we're not going to answer it. It's about relevance. I mean, it's about our inboxes. It's about our attention spans. And we've got to personalize it and stand out. Uh, look, we've been doing email since the, the mid 90s and we still are today and will be tomorrow. And you and I both know the difference between an email that makes us feel good, an email that is actually personalized to us versus 95% of it, which is complete spam at this point. And so I think it's the same character. Like you can use email really, really well. I can use a telephone really, really well. Unfortunately, most people are using it really, really poorly most of the time. So it's not about, is it a video or is email saturated or is phone saturated? It's, am I leveraging uh, uh, the channel in a way that creates a better experience? And that's really what we think about every day. Absolutely. And I think, um, again, uh, building off to of something I said earlier, you know, to the degree that we focus on the donor's experience. So what is it that, that they're experiencing and how are they experiencing that? And if that drives what we do and how we do it versus, you know, what we've made an investment in. So we got to get our money's worth or, you know, what we think we ought to be doing or how we want people to behave one way or another, or whatever it may be, go down the list. We all have examples. Um, but if you can just stop doing that in that way and start focusing on what, what is, what is the experience that our donors are having and how can we improve upon that? It, it is amazing the ideas you'll get from all over your team and elsewhere. And again, just the interest and commitment that people bring to, um, to that conversation and, and to implementing the strategies that come out of that. And if you can say, we've got all these different channels, all these different tools, all these different resources at our disposal. If we were to try to design the best donor experience possible, what would that look like? And how would, how would we go about doing it? The answer might be different for different donors and different staff, and you know, depending on where they sit and what they do. And, and, uh, but, but presenting it in that way and thinking about it in that way and making decisions that way, um, I think is, um, one, it's just a lot more fun. And two, you know, the result is just, um, it just seems to be better. Last thing, um, we often talk about mentorship on this program. I know that we're at time and I'd just love to give you an opportunity to give some of your mentors a shout out over the years. And then I'm also going to ask you about a couple of your mentees, but let's talk mentors first. Mentors, gosh. Well, um, obviously the the first mentor I had uh, was my father and just uh, the guidance and direction and support that he gave me when I was trying to discern what to do. And, and then uh, once I got into this work, um, you know, uh, just the opportunity to have those conversations with him about, hey, here's what I'm experiencing, what, you know, what do I do? And um, unfortunately, I, I lost him um, many years ago. And so um, I, I've had a lot of other folks in my life since um, my father passed that have been both personal and, and professional mentors The uh, from, you know, professors at, at TCU to professional colleagues. Um, I, I really, I really appreciate um, uh, Bill McGoldrick. He, um, he's he been TCU's campaign consultant for ever since I've been back here. And gosh, Bill's history and experience uh, is just, um, it's just, it's so rich. And he's just uh, has this amazing way of saying things and, and, and helping you think about things that um, I just, I really love and appreciate. And I, obviously I wouldn't even have the opportunity that I have to do what I'm doing today if it, if it weren't for, for Don Whalen, our Vice Chancellor for Advancement. And Don and I, this, this is probably gonna, I think you know this, Brent, but a lot of people don't know this. So 
I, I came back to TCU in 05. So the chancellor at TCU right now, Chancellor Braschini, he came in 03. Don Whalen came in 05. Don hired me later in 05. So the chancellor, Don, and I have worked together at TCU since 2005. We're all still here together. And the opportunity to be able to work with people uh, for that long and get to know one another and uh, to have fun, uh, you know, really experiencing success together, like setting out plans and then implementing those plans and seeing the, the fruit of that is just been, it's been fantastic. And so I'm, I'm, I just, I can't say enough, you know, I mentioned Nevin earlier and David Anderson, and there's just so many others that I've worked for, worked with over time that have had a, a major influence on my life and my career. And, um, I, I just, I really appreciate all of them and really appreciate the need that we all have to both have that external support, but also that external challenge and that external validation. Um, it's just, uh, really meaningful. You also shared that you have two sons and you've maybe spent a minute or two mentoring them along the way. I have three sons. They are nine, seven and almost four. What should I know? What have you learned? Teach me. <laughs> well, uh, you've already broken my number one rule, and that is play man-to-man -man defense. So you're uh, you're already in a zone. So good luck to you with that. Um, I I don't know, Brent. I I don't know. Um, I don't know what kind of parent I've been. Um, I I've tried to be positive, encouraged, supporting. Um, tried to um, help them develop a sense of, of confidence. And and really, at the end of the day, the thing I'm most proud of is. I think both my kids really genuinely care about people and really worry about how people feel and, and kind of what they do, how the, what they do impacts other people. And if there's whatever happens in the rest of their life, career wise, family wise, or anything else, you know, just knowing that, that that's how they've turned out partly, partly because of the environment they were raised in, but partly just, I think who they are and how they are in the world. Um, I, I'm really, really proud of that. And, and, and uh, I know, you know, what a, an honor or privilege it is. Love that, David. Thank you for sharing and, uh, you know, for sharing your journey. And I, uh, I didn't know that I would, you know, learn more about Moldova and, uh, <laughs> and, and more. Uh, that's been one of the real privileges of this, this podcast is we don't script it too much and you never know where it's going to take us. But um, very, very neat to, to hear your, your journey of just really being born sort of into this profession and, and growing up, um, you know, personally and professionally in, in the field and maintaining, uh, you know, genuine commitment and passion for it after all these years and, and having a unique level of tenure, you know, in a space where unfortunately it, it seems like, um, you know, most people have had to move around to advance at times we've almost compared it to like the military. You got to go base to base if you want to advance and, and you, and, and also, you know, many of your colleagues have really had a unique opportunity to, to dig in and, and be all in on TCU, which, which I know uh, many other leaders wish, wish they could sort of um, experience that level of stability. So it's been really fun to learn more about it. Thank you, Brian. I appreciate the opportunity. And it's um, I, I don't, I don't often stop and kind of think back on, on these kinds of topics in this way. So I, I really appreciate the opportunity you've created to, um, to help myself remember what, why I do what I do and, and uh, kind of where I've come from. That's, um, well, that's, that's what we're here for, David. Uh, really appreciate you. Wish you all uh, the absolute best. I think we've got um, all four of the college football playoff finalists are, ever true customers in some form or fashion. <laughs> so you can't they're, lose. They're just ties all around. I hope yeah. it's just in perpetuity, but uh, <laughs> most important that you all have a ton of fun, that nobody gets hurt. Uh, and so with that, uh, I will close today's episode with our guest, David Nolan, who is the Associate Vice Chancellor of University Development and Campaign Director at Texas Christian University. Take care, everybody. <laughs>